Hello, my name is Noah, and today on the channel, I'm going to be interviewing Amir. Hello, Amir. Hey, how's it going, man? Sweet. Thanks for letting me interview you. It's awesome. So, Amir, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of his background, he is a indie developer and the developer of the mobile game A Dark Room, which has been number one on the App Store and has 2.5 million downloads. He has yep. also some other great games, including Enzyme, A Noble Circle, and Beautiful Go. He is very helpful in the developer community and has written a book called Surviving the App Store, which gives tons of great tips on how to further your chances of making a successful mobile game. So, I uh, just have some questions for you, Mir. The first one awesome. being... Uh, just to give us a little more background, what did you start doing in your career? All right, so I um, I went to I went to school in Dallas. Pretty much grew, grew up and raised in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. So uh, I went to a local community, uh, local college here, University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I graduated with a degree in software engineering and computer science in uh, December of 2006. So then after that, I joined like the corporate nine to five world and i did yep. that till about 2013 and uh, may of 2013 uh, march march of 2013 and that's when i decided to kind of take a sabbatical you know i was kind of burned out with cubicle work and you know the nine to five and everything and so i decided to take some time off and you know start building up my uh, build, building something and uh, that's when i wanted to just kind of look at what was out there i knew i wanted to build a video game because i love building building video games so i saw what michael did for uh, a darkroom web so you can you can play for free like a, I think it's a darkroom.doublespeakgames.com and uh, you can play that game for free you know kind of try it out but I, I saw the game really enjoyed it and then I decided to decided just to port it over to iOS strictly as a learning experience I didn't expect to make any money off of it so you know it just took some time and did that and then I guess I hit the lottery yeah. so to speak just lucked out and um, you know that's all she wrote so um, a lot of this is in in the book uh, for I guess the people that are listening. If you go to surviving the uh, lean pub, l e a n p u b dot com forward slash surviving the app store forward slash c as in coupon forward slash free, you can get the book for free. So that coupon and I'll put that yeah. link uh, in the description of this video yeah. so they can find that easily. Yeah. So I mean, feel free to download. I'm not trying to pitch the book or anything. Just uh, there's just a lot of information in there that you know obviously we can't fit in a oh yeah and a, and yeah, I've read the book and it's it was very helpful to me as a yep uh, indie developer wanting to do that same kind of thing so that's it was yeah. it was very good so I definitely recommend it um, so when you took that sabbatical was were you kind of taking a risk or was it really just you just wanted a break you weren't really expecting to do anything to make more income during that time it was more just a break from work. Yeah, it was just a break from work, and I and I really want to emphasize that um, I don't recommend don't don't quit your job and try to make a number one app. You'll <laughs> it, it won't go well. I promise you. Yeah. Um, but you know, I kind of like I lived well below my means. Um, kind of basically, I said, you know, I've I've been li living like a college student for so long. Might as well keep doing it. So uh, I kind of did that, and um, yeah. Over over that, you know, I guess what seven year period, seven to eight year period. I, I saved up a lot of money by doing that. So um, I had about I had about one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in the bank when I when I decided, and you know, I'm just going to take some time off. Yeah. And um, and I said, you know, I'm going to put these chips on the table. Like the money's spent. Um, I, I took fifty grand out and just kind of plumped it into my checkings account. And I said, when I run out of that fifty grand, I'll go back to work. And that was the only thing. Like that's the only thing I wanted to do. And so it wasn't trying to make money. Um, it was really calculated. It was more of like an emotional, you know, kind of betterment aspect to it, as opposed to as opposed to doing any kind of income. So please, mm -hmm. please, whoever's listening, to it, don't quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> don't take that kind of risk. You know, think about it. Um, if that's something that you're interested in doing, at least take like three months off. I think anything less than three months is is too short of a period. Um, it just takes you one month just to try to get into a new groove. So if you only take one month off, you're just spending a month trying to build new habits and it's just not worth it. So if you want to do it, you know, save three to six months of income and maybe give it a shot. But yeah, yeah. just be really, really conservative on, on what you'll get out of it. Yeah, so I think there is kind of uh, a belief that 
developers may have out there that don't know a ton about the app store but just kind of believing that all you have to do is make an app and you'll be really successful and you'll bring in a lot of money so i know for myself like just from you know more research and stuff that that's really not a true thing can you speak to that yes it's really hard uh i Pretty much anyone that emails me about saying, "Hey, I want to build an app," I say, "Okay, well, you'll uh, the successful apps out there make four thousand a year. So is that enough? Is is that enough money from you?" And you know, a lot of people are really surprised, like, "Wow, only four grand for an entire year on a really success on a successful app?" And I'm like, "Yeah, that's kind of what you have to make. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. So especially with the way the mobile market is today, um, you have to build many apps. So it's not about a one hit wonder. It's about having multiple apps out there each generating some small income for a niche audience and then you know cross cross promoting that stuff and that's that's the nature that is that is the app store as it, or app store the mobile landscape at it, as it is right now uh, there's a large there's a, there are large AAA companies that can afford um, you know user acquisition at eight dollars a person right and if you can if you can't afford to spend eight dollars a person to to buy a specific game then to buy your game, then it's just it's just unrealistic to think that you know you you can you can make a really successful number one app, and uh, and like I said, it's lu- it was lucky from my my standpoint too. So go in knowing that you'll only make about four grand a year. Yeah. So looking yep. more at the app store, I saw a statistic. This may be like maybe two years old or so, but that okay. there is you know four hundred new apps added to the app store every day. It's probably more than that uh, now. So would you say, from your opinion, is it harder uh, to get an app uh, to be known and successful now than it was even a couple of years ago? Uh, I would say it was just as hard. So in, even in 2013, there were, you know, a billion, over a billion apps out there. So, uh, you know, what's, what's another 50 million more or 500 million more? Like, you're, you're already at a billion. So, um, so... Uh, it's just as hard, and um, and the I think the thing that has made it harder is that more AAA companies are taking notice of the App Store and the revenue potential. Like Nintendo, you know, just recently released, so they're even taking notice, and um, I think that's what dilutes dilutes the landscape a bit more and makes it a lot harder for smaller smaller shops or small indie indie game shops to to make a bit to make an impact. Um, and it's just the nature of the situation. So really what you have to concentrate on with making a successful app or game is you have to find your niche and not not try to try to cater to the, the general audience because the AAA companies are going to do that. So, yeah, build an app about a Civil War reenactment and then find the forums that take that talk about Civil War reenactments and then that's your that's your customer base. Right. And those are the ones that are going to support you in future games. And that's kind of how you need to take it. Yeah. So I want to look more uh, at what it's kind of like to be an indie developer. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, indie developers kind of have to do everything. Uh, You have to do the marketing and the business stuff for your projects. So what percentage of the time do you put towards marketing and what percentage is working on your actual game? Uh, So every Sunday is every Sunday basically gets uh, devoted to marketing. So um, that is either writing blog posts, writing about the book. Uh, reaching out, following up on uh, people that have you know reached out to me or haven't reached, haven't replied to my emails yet. So pretty much 20% of my time uh, it goes to marketing existing assets. So um, that that's a given. If you build a new game, after you've built the game, you have to you know spend a good amount of time just marketing that new release and and building and building some kind of um, notoriety around it. So after after a dark room released to the uh, to the um, I, iOS App Store, the App Store, which was in November, I spent December, January, February, March, four months, pretty much twenty hours a week marketing the game, and uh, that's generally kind of how it works. Uh, it's it's surprising, you know. It, it goes back to what you said, right? It's not just about building the game. There's a lot of hard work to to get people to know who you are. As a developer, and then know the game itself, and uh, it's just a component of it. It's a it's a forever lasting component. Yeah, and yeah, it's uh, I enjoy it, you know, because I get to talk with people like you, which is great. 
Um, but you know, it's it's definitely not as fun as I guess coding in a in a cave, you know, on yep. cool cool stuff, right? Yeah. And I I guess that's what most people look at when they go into game development. It's just not it's just not all that, unfortunately. And then uh, once a month once a month I have to do uh, accounting. And that's like eight hours worth of stuff, right? Yeah. And then once a quarter, I have to do taxes. So <laughs> there's that aspect too. Yep. So it's just like, oh, it's tax day or oh, it's counting days. Um, so those <laughs> things just, you know, cut into development time. And it'll, and it'll just get, um, I, I expect that I'll be spending more and more time as I build more and more assets. Um, and November time frame, around November time frame, uh, most of my time is devoted to making sure all my apps work. Uh, for new devices, for new operating systems, and thing for new OSs that come out. Yeah, and that in itself is again not time spent on building new stuff. It's about maintenance. Yeah, it's so not the exciting part of developing apps. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So a month is gone right there, and then eight hours every month, and then eight hours every Sunday, and then eight hours every quarter. So it it adds up. Yeah, so that definitely paints more of a picture of what it's like being an indie developer. Some people, you know, think it's very glamorous, all fun, and doing it, what you want, but it's def- it's definitely not that all the yeah, time. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I get to I get a nap every day. Like it's it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> three three o'clock comes around, I'm like, I'm tired. I'm gonna take a nap. So <laughs> well, so yeah, you do get to work your own schedule, which that's that's yeah. nice. Yeah, and uh, another thing is I work every day, so I'll work a good six hours every day but it's only six hours right so i'll wake up in the morning do a good you know three 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 and a half hours uh eat work out go to sleep relax with the wife and then work for another work for another three three to four hours depending on how i feel and it's just an everyday thing and it's just you know part of life and Mm -hmm. i enjoy doing it and it's it's good from that standpoint but those naps man (laughs) you love those naps (laughs) oh they're so awesome they're so awesome (laughs) So uh, sometimes when, you know, I'm in the shower, I I have a project and I'm really, you know, you always get into a rut where you're kind of down on whatever you're working on. Um, So Mm -hmm. do you know or remember a specific moment when working on your games where you kind of just questioned what and why you were doing that and you were just really down about it? Uh, Definitely. Every game. Every game I build. And you'll get to that point because you keep seeing the same game over and over again, uh, especially over like a four or five month period, you know. And uh, all the newness wears off because you know you built the thing, right? So you know exactly how how everything's going to work out, and how the levels, and how the bosses, how the storyline is going to go. And you start questioning, you know, the validity of your game. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I the way I battle that is by just releasing the game early. So uh, with like a noble circle, yeah, it wasn't complete. I mean, it was there was barely like a chapter done, but I went ahead and released it. And uh, I got support through the reviews, and they were like, hey, we like where it's going. Uh, we believe in you as a developer. Keep doing it. So with every release, I got people saying, yes, I like what you're doing. And that really helped battle um, some of the some of that. Uh, uh, it's called, um, I think the word is imposter syndrome. So you can actually like uh-huh. Google and search for that word. And it's called imposter syndrome where you just feel like what you're working on is not good enough or you know, no one's going to play it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's two things that get you through it. Uh, well, there's one thing that will get you through it, and it's the most important thing, and that's discipline. And you just you just do it, right? You just take it a day at a time. Passion will... Hold on one second. Riku, be quiet. Hush. Uh, passion will wax and wane, right? You're going to have motivation go up and down uh, throughout your development. It's a discipline of just opening up the computer, working on something that gets you through. And that's what you really have to concentrate on. Yeah, you were talking about your strategy, I know, with a noble circle, um, <clears throat> with like releasing it out earlier and then updating it for uh, people. So you found that that's worked uh, pretty well. Um, I I feel like with that, is there ever an issue where people download your game, uh, they play it and then they delete it so they never see like those new updates and see um, the new things that you're adding in? I would feel like, there is. is that a problem? Okay. Yeah, there is. The, but the issue is that no one's going to download your game. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's the other aspect of it, right? So let's say you update your first release. You may have 10 downloads. And uh, let's say none of them come back. Okay, you've lost 10 people. The second time you release your game, uh, let's say one of them stays, right? So you, you had nine people go away and one of them stayed. They like the update and then they tell their friends. 
right? And yeah. what you're what you're doing is you're weeding out. You're kind of weeding out the people that probably wouldn't support you in the long run, anyways. So mm-hmm. you're you're catering to those people that stay with you from update to update, release to release, and um, that's who you want to cater to, right? So by the end of the by the end of the release of the game, you've built a complete game using feedback for the people that supported you throughout the release of the game and then from that you've created a style you've created a game mechanic a polish that is amicable to those to those people that stuck with you so then the next game you build um cater to that t- cater to that niche and um you'll you'll continue to see that kind of support so it's about finding the hundred people that will pay you ten dollars a month to keep doing what you're doing right yeah that's, and that's that's kind of how it works so I know a noble circle is, you know, it's a game that has kind of a storyline. Do you think that strategy wouldn't work as well, you know, with, you know, the different kinds of games? Maybe it's more of an action game. There's no storyline. Do you think that kind of strategy could still work with a game like that? Uh, so primarily on a mobile, I think it's really important to have to have that kind of narrative. So there's kind of three pillars that I've that I've observed on on the mobile platform. There is the um, the game mechanic the polish for the game, like the production quality, and the narrative. And all the games that you see out there, at least the top grossing ones, um, are really, really good at game mechanic and polish. Um, and you can see that. You can you download the editorial's choice, you, you download whatever. They are super slick looking. They have you know tight controls, really simple controls. Um, and you, you, you see that. So the thing, the pillar that's kind of kind of not getting enough attention is the narrative or is the storyline. And for me, because I'm only one guy, there's only so much polish I can do, right? I don't have an artist. Um, there's only so much I can do. So I, could, I have to compensate somehow. And game mechanic I'm pretty good at. Uh, I think I can make a really solid, you know, good, good feeling game. Polish, there's only so much I can do because I'm only one person. And uh, so, the, so I compensate with narrative. And that's kind of my modus operandum that I've that I work in and uh, uh, it's something that I think indie developers can have an edge on by by emphasizing the narrative because it has heart and it has a personality and people can see that yeah so uh, personally I think it's important at least on the mobile platform and then it's definitely kind of a niche because there's definitely less I'd say mobile games that have a storyline and exactly yeah yeah especially especially a storyline that can be dulled out in in short play sessions I think that's important too. You like mobile game developer, m- mobile gamers don't have the time to sit and play for thirty minutes straight. Yeah. So if you can doll out a, a narrative or a storyline that's in like two minute, you know, bites or five minute bites, uh, that's that's a good sweet spot to be in. And that's kind of where I, where I'm trying to uh, where I'm trying to find find my uh, find my groove, I guess. Yeah. That that seems like a good plan, and obviously it's worked mostly so yep. far for you so that's sweet yeah um what is so what would you say is the one hardest thing uh being an indie developer uh the the biggest thing uh, the one thing i really struggle with is is primarily emotional i really enjoy what i'm doing and um the the problem is that everything's volatile right you it's a kind of a feast and famine uh, kind of cycle right you especially with your first game you you have no idea how your game's going to do month the next month so there's a there's an emotional weight that's on you that says i really enjoy what i'm doing but it's going to come to an end and i have to go back to not doing it and uh, i think that's the that's the hardest part of of being an indie game developer because you found something that you really really love to do and um it's a struggle that's the biggest struggle i have uh so i think that's going to get better with time primarily because i'll have more games but right now, it's still in that situation where it's like, man, uh, I'm kind, quote unquote, living paycheck to paycheck, uh, uh-huh. especially after taxes and you know estimated taxes, royalty splits, and all that stuff. Uh, you, I'm kind, I'm kind of living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck at this point, uh, which is okay because before that I was losing money, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, and I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but then it, it, there's always that question in the back of my head where it's like, well, uh, you know, do I keep doing this? What about retirement? What about you know all the other things that uh, the security aspect of things that I may be giving up by continuing to do this? And um, it's you know you just gotta take you gotta do the numbers you gotta objectively evaluate where you're at every month and uh, 
kind of work with it, you know, take the emotion out of it. But that's, that's, that's the hardest struggle for me. So, uh, programmers out there will know that, you know, you're always, you're going to hit a roadblock at some point. You're not going to be able to think, uh, on that particular, uh, problem much longer. Maybe you need a break. Do you, uh, so when that happens to you, do you switch to a different project, uh, or do you just take a break or do you just always have one project going at once? Um, I actually refactor code. So I'll, if, if I hit a roadblock and I can't think of, you know, the storyline or narrative or something, I'll go back and reread the code that I've written and see if I can clean it up. And it's just kind of one of those like meditative things where it's like, I know future me is going to appreciate, you know, these fixes because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things you're like in the, in the heat of the, you're in the heat of the moment. And you're like, oh yeah, I want to, I want to add this new game mechanic. And then you've got all this like wad of crappy code. So during those roadblocks, like, all right, let me let me read old code. Let me see if I can fix some of these formatting things or style things or you know conceptual conceptual game models, and that's okay to do. And you know during that time period, it's kind of relaxing, uh, and you're still productive and you're still focused on that specific project. And um, and then you get out of the rut. Like after after a couple of days of doing that, you're like, hey, you know this code base looks pretty good now, and you you have some ideas in the back of the head that back of your head that we're kind of mulling over that you can. They can now implement, and so I've I found that that really helps. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So for the future, um, do you have any new ideas, or what's it look like for the future of your games? I know you're working on finishing up a Noble Circle. Any other plans, future endeavors you're doing? Yeah. So a Noble Circle is done. Finally, uh, the release is going to happen on January 18th. So that's when I've scheduled. The release to go out. Nice. So I'm testing, you know, doing doing the beta testing and the feedback. Excuse me, the feedback loop. And um, uh, the book is done, so that's that's off my plate too. And so I'm like a free bird right now. Uh, I'm gonna probably take about a month off to to get. It's gonna be tax season, so I gotta do taxes anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, so I gotta do that. I'll take a month to kind of think about what I want to do next. Uh, but right now, I don't have I don't have anything in the works. Uh, a couple of options is uh, doing maybe the pre prequel to a dark room, so complete the trilogy for a dark room. Uh, okay. Another option is working on a new game that I'm thinking about is called Sasha, and the idea behind that game is it's almost like a Tamagotchi uh, kind of like raise your raise a pet, but this pet is not a pet; it's an operating system. Interesting. So it's like <laughs> it's like this it's like this little operating system that lives in your phone. And, you know, she's, she's like talking with you, calls you mom and it's like, why am I stuck in this phone or uh, what do I do, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it's a, it's a more darker tone uh, for, for raising something and uh, see if I can explore the emotions that are involved with uh, raising an inanimate object and see if I can get you uh, feeling some love, for, back of, <laughs> for lack of a better term, for uh-huh. this for this digital thing and then uh, and see where I can take that. So that's an idea. Um, I also have an uh, idea for like just a really cool racing game. So top down, uh, top down Hot Wheels style drifting racing game. Uh, just just as a fun arcade thing. So that's that's another idea. But all those things are kind of exploratory and just kind of in pre-production and on paper. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really I haven't really done anything with that. So yeah, it's just going to take a month off and relax for a little bit. It's been a long year. Three games, three games completed, um, a book completed. Yeah, I'm gonna binge on League of Legends and and uh, Binding of Isaac and and do some research, do some uh, game research. That's the cool thing about being an indie game developer. You can you can write off all all that stuff. Like I've written off my PlayStation Four. I write I write off all the games that I've that I've bought because it's like, hey, it's it's research. I mean. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so all those are business expenses for me. It's the best thing in the world. <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. Well, those so sound like some, research. some sweet projects. Those some interesting game ideas for sure. I'd definitely like to see some of those uh, in the future. That's awesome. Cool, cool. Well, thank you, Amir. I think that's all the questions I have. Awesome. Um, so yeah, guys, definitely go and check out his book, Surviving the App Store. If you are a developer, it's definitely really helpful. And also check out Amir's apps on the App Store. All right. Well, thank you. 
All right, have a good one, man.